Well, a very good morning to you all. Welcome to our worship service today. And uh, how very nice it is to be with you. It's been three and a half years already since uh, retired. Uh, I don't know where that's gone. Uh, I think we've all lost two years due to COVID, mind you. And uh, it's 12 years since I was your interim moderator, believe it or not, how uh, the years have gone by. So it is pleasant to be for myself and Jesse to be with you today. We're actually uh, over in the campsite in Fortrose the last couple of couple of days, but you can't see Fortrose at the moment for mist, so the sun is shining on you here in Maryborough. So let's uh, begin the public worship of God today on this day with Psalm 103 from the Scottish Psalter, page 369, but it's on the screen, so thou my soul bless God the Lord, and all that in me is be stirred up his holy name to magnify and bless, and we'll sing. Oh, oh, my join together in prayer. Gracious God, we give thanks for this your own day, one day in seven where we can set things uh, apart so that we can make time to come together in public worship on this day that you have appointed for us to do so. We give thanks as we come together for the promise of your people having the Spirit of God with them, that the Lord Jesus Christ will be with his people where they are gathered, that we have that promise. But we pray that for each of us as individuals that we would not grieve the Holy Spirit, but that as we come and worship, as we bow in your presence, that we may rejoice in the advocate that we have with you, the Lord Jesus Christ and that we can be refreshed as we come to you through him, having our sins, our ongoing sins forgiven, or indeed that initial coming to have our sins forgiven and forgotten, 
and to have your presence with us and to be renewed and to be refreshed on your day, to come together to praise you now and to look forward to that day when we'll be free from sin completely and to praise you forever, that it will be our highest ecstasy uh, to praise you and to be in your nearer presence. But even now we pray for the uh, presence of heaven even it, while we are still on earth, to experience something of the church triumphant while we are still in the bottle of the church militant. We pray for your spirit and strength for us in the church militant and whatever challenges that lie before us, not least in the domain of the preaching the gospel and witnessing to it, but also the other challenges for many of us, physical challenges from one day to another, praying for grace and for strength to face up to these things in this world and to show forth the Lord Jesus Christ wherever we can, even in those difficult conditions that we may find ourselves in. But we give thanks that by and large that we find that the lines have fallen in pleasant places for us, and that we have many blessings to give thanks for, and much rejoicing uh, to do. So help us to do that in our spirit today, as we, we come in this time of worship. Unite us together, we pray individuals, and yet uh, collectively, that we would be enabled to praise your most holy name, and that our praises, our prayers, our worship would be acceptable to you as we present them to you <clears throat> through the new and living way, the Lord Jesus Christ, at your right hand. And it's in his name and for his sake that we do pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, the second day of singing is uh, from Mission Praise, and it's a Amazing Grace. One of the things that we'll mention in the sermon in a moment or two is about grace, but not amazing grace in the sense of receiving forgiveness of our sins, but about growing in grace. But before we can grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to experience the amazing grace of God towards us in Christ through the repentance of our sins and to God the Father through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus. So this hymn will remind us something of, something of that. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. So let's stand to sing.
But our reading is taken from the New Testament and the second epistle of Peter. Second Peter and chapter 3. Second Peter then at chapter, he, at chapter 3. Let's hear God's word to us on this occasion. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the word that then existed, existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient, patient towards you not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for the hastening, the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these things, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen indeed, and may the Lord add his own blessing then to this reading, public reading of his holy and infallible word. Well, let's come in prayer of intercession. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, in the light of this uh, particular reading, we see how things uh, change, and yet you're the God who never changes, and that you have a plan that has been set in place from before the foundation of the world, and that this world will one day come to an end, and you shall usher in a new heaven and a new earth. And so we are admonished or we are challenged to consider what sort of people ought we to be as we live in this world and yet not to be of it because we are so aware in these days in our own land of the secular society in which we, we live and the many atheistic principles 
that we see around us being advocated by the scoffers. And we pray that we would be enabled ourselves, while we live in a changing world, not to change, certainly not in terms of our faith, but to put our roots down and to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus so that we might be witnesses, living epistles, to be known and read by all men around us in this day and age. Praying for your Spirit to anoint our witness and anoint the gospel that is still proclaimed in our land, to anoint it unto the salvation of many, that many may come out of that darkness that they are in and come into the glorious light of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We bless you for Jesus today and for his coming, for his ministry, for his witness, for example, for the cross in particular and the resurrection, but also that he is the one who is at your right hand and will come again according to the promise that we've just read. And so we pray that while we look at these things and not know the day that it may come, that we would be those who are seeking diligently to be like Christ, to be more like him, to grow in that way and to uh, long for the day when we shall see him as he is and to be finally like him. So bless that, we pray. We pray for those who are in this congregation who are unable now because of the passing of time to come as they once came to the worship services, for those that may be listening in today through the technology that we have, which we give uh, thanks for. And uh, we pray your blessing upon them as we seek blessing for ourselves and for all the challenges that lie before us, both physically and spiritually. We pray for the wider church, both uh, here locally and uh, throughout our land and the world, as we pray that you'd be with your people and help them whatever situation they find themselves in. We pray for the world that you love. We think of all the sores and disputes and wars and places of tension that there are in the world and during these days. It uh, uh, does indeed speak to us of end time um, prophecies, uh, though no doubt that there has always been uh, such things. And indeed we are in those last days that last from the resurrection or the ascension of Christ until he comes, and that we are to expect these things. May these things not cause us to falter in our faith, wondering why you allow such things to take place. But we would be with your people in these things, be with uh, those indeed who are not your people and yet who are seeking to be leaders of people and nations. We pray that everything that comes to pass may be done in accordance with your will and purpose, as we pray for those who are in great strife this day, that you'd grant them peace, and not least through the peace that comes from knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, even in the midst of conflict. Be with us now as we sing, and as we come to your word, we pray that we'd remember that this is part of our worship also, to engage uh, in the word and to seek to be obedient to it, as we ask all In the precious name of Jesus, and for his sake. Amen. Well, before we come to a text from that chapter, we're going to sing Mission Praise number 51. It's uh, Be Thou My Vision. Be Thou My Vision. Vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me save that Thou art. So let's stand to sing then this hymn. Be thou my vision.
that was uh, quite a hefty doctrinal uh, passage that we read through, uh, but the, the text that I want to take uh, from the chapter is the very last verse, verse 18. And uh, I am, in, in a way, cutting it off from the rest of the chapter in one, in one sense, uh, although we're living in an age of great uh, secularism and there are many scoffers uh, that don't believe what we believe in. And our text, verse 18, is to, if we're obedient to it and to seek to grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ, is to make us more Christ-like so that we might be living epistles known and read by all men in the society of which we are a part, to be in the world but not of it, so that we may have opportunity and God may use our witness uh, to bring many out of this uh, uh, darkness that they're in before the day comes when it will be too late to, to do so when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. So the text is verse 18. But grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Well, what I want to, to do, I have a word of introduction, and then I'm going to have four points by splitting the text into four parts. So first of all, a word of introduction. And uh, much indeed of what I have to say today it comes from uh, personal testimony, and uh, might be something more of that maybe in the evening. Uh, so We'll see how we get on with that. But I, I would just like to say to you that not that long after I was converted, perhaps two or three years after I was converted, this is going back to 1981, I read a book on the impeccability of Christ. The impeccability of Christ. Now I'll spare you the details, but it was a book that was about the temptation of Christ in the wilderness. And it was dealing with his divine nature and his human nature. And uh, as I read this book, I was spiritually uplifted. Yet paradoxically, I was disappointed. I was disappointed in myself that for the first two or three years of my new life in Christ, that I hadn't sought to know more about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ than I had done. The person of Christ is, is, uh, uh, is one person, two natures, his divinity and his human nature. That I hadn't uh, sought to uh, seek to know more about him than I was doing. Instead, what I had been doing, and I have an excuse for it in a way, I was working among 40 other men in uh, the distilleries of Brora and Kleinish, two distilleries that we have in Brora. They went down to one, but they're back up to two distilleries now. And I was working there among 40 men. And the kind of material that I was reading when I was converted was of a, an apologetic nature. Uh, one of the first books I, I, I bought, and I bought it from Harry Woods. Harry Woods and Mary had a Christian bookshop in Rogert. So it wasn't too far away to go. 10, 14 miles down to Rogert from Brora, from where I, where we, I, I was brought up in Brora. So we go down there. Harry Woods was the, the minister uh, there in Rogert, and he was indeed instrumental for me preaching in the free church for the first time uh, in Scourie. Rogert and Scourie were joined together at that time, and I was in the Church of Scotland at that time. But down to get a book. And the first, one of the first books, if not the first book that I, that I bought, was uh, Halley's book on alleged discrepancies in the Bible. Because I didn't want anybody to be coming up to me and say, oh, but it says this here and it says that there. And I wanted to have the answer about alleged discrepancies. And then the second book that I bought, and there's one that you should have, and it's a great book for passing on to people that you feel are really interested in the Lord and seeking. And it's Josh McDowell, one of Josh McDowell's books. Uh, Evidence that demands a verdict. It's about the fulfillment of prophecy. It's about uh, uh, why we can trust the resurrection to be 
uh, a fact, uh, something that would stand up in the court of law. That kind of book. That's the kind of books I was reading about uh, defending the faith. But in all honesty, I wasn't doing it to defend the faith. I was doing it to defend me. Now, that might be wrong, I don't know, but that's the way it was going. But then when I picked up this book on the impeccability of Christ, I suddenly realized, I'm looking in the wrong direction here. I should be looking to the Savior, (coughs) my Savior here. Um, To him be the glory both now and forever. uh, Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that my attention should have been uh, upon him. And of course, uh, one thing led to another, and I decided I would go to the Free Church College, as it was then, to study there as a private student. <clears throat> I was still in the Church of Scotland. And things don't necessarily get any better when you go to college. You think, well, if I go to a theological college, I'll find out more about Jesus. Well, that was a bit of a surprise, wasn't it, Oleg? Uh, Hebrew, Greek, church history, pastoral theology, church principles, homiletics, summary. <laughs> Okay, for some of us. And even when we're looking forward after two years of all that to get into systematic theology, oh, we'll get uh, near to Jesus now, you end up having uh, uh, lectures on creeds rather than on Christ himself. So it doesn't necessarily get any better. Now, you'll all know my good friend, <clears throat> the Reverend Tommy Eckert. Tommy and I worked in the distillery in uh, 1969. And Tommy was converted then. <clears throat> he was converted in 1969. And he let, his conscience wouldn't allow him to continue to work in the distillery. <clears throat> it was two distilleries. But he went to the mill, the woolen mill that was in Baroda at the time. And from there he went to the faith mission. And then from the faith mission, he went to the Baptist college in, in Belfast. That's where he met his Irish wife uh, there. And uh, the rest is history in that sense. But Tommy became the Baptist minister in Oban, and after that he went to Dalkeith. And Dalkeith wasn't far from where we were staying in Edinburgh, so I spent quite a lot of time with him in Edinburgh. It's a bit of a nuisance, however, in that there was two buses required to get to Dalkeith on a Sunday. Uh, well, it was the same through the week, but on a Sunday the buses were every half hour rather than every 15 minutes. So for most of the time I, we went to Baclou. But... Uh, Tommy was telling me about this experience of the dryness of study. Too much study is wearisome for the soul. It can take us away from the Lord even when we're dealing with things that are necessary to make a, a minister have an all-round ministry and to know about the history and pastoral things. And, and All of those things are necessary. I'm not saying that they're not. But you know, he said to me, he said, Sunday, you know what I did to get through that? He said, on all my folders, every class that I would go to in the in the college, and uh, so on. He said, I had a motto. I said, well, that's quite a good idea, Tommy. I'm sure. Uh, What was your motto? To know him better. That's what he wrote. One of these things that used to type out the letters on plastic, you know, and they stick it on there. And I'm offering this as a motto to you today and to me. In everything that we do, You don't have to actually write it on your Bible and uh, as such, but every time we go to the Bible, every time we pick up our devotional books, every time we're reading, to know him better, to have our focus, whatever it is, whether it be uh, reading uh, Harley's alleged discrepancies of the Bible, whatever it may be, to know him better. And so out of that introduction, we come to the first of our four points as we break the text down. Firstly, we see here, seek to grow in grace. Why? To know him better. Grow in grace. This is how our text begins. Now, grace, I think, is something that we need to ask God for. And I never really thought about that much, even although I'm along the road, Christian road, a long time, that I need to ask it's not necessarily something that's going to happen automatically. It's something I should be asking God for. You do not have, said James. Why not? Because you don't ask. Now, I ask God for many things, as you do, I'm sure. And I'm not sure about some of the things I am asking him for. 
I don't think I should maybe be asking him for them. Um, maybe that's why you don't get them. But this is something that he would give to us. He would give to me if I'd ask him. Surely he wants us to have this grace, uh, to grow in grace. So it, in the first instance, it's something we need to ask God for. But how is he going to give it to us? Well, I believe that what is, is, is absolutely necessary here is to be devoted to the Scriptures, to be reading the Scriptures. And not just to be reading them, but to be obedient to them and to be seeking in that way to be growing in grace. We need to be like the man in a way uh, in Psalm 1. He's likened to a tree there, isn't he? And he's, he's growing by a river and he's putting down deep roots. And that's what we need to do as we read the Scriptures. We're putting... as, as we mature as, as Christians, we're converted and we, we mature uh, in our Christian, Christianity and uh, in our knowledge of the Scriptures. We're putting down roots, and those roots grasp hold of rocks, as it were, so that when the winds come, well, when the tree grows up, the roots go down, the winds come, we're anchored. We're anchored, in this, especially in this secular age where everything seems to be uh, against Christians and against Christianity. We need to have a very strong faith system, and it's based on the Scriptures. It's based on a personal relationship with God, and uh, this is how we are to receive it. And as the, the tree goes up, the branches go out, and as we mature, we are to be shelters for those who are little saplings underneath us, so to speak, especially for those who are perhaps called into the ministry or into the, the eldership. We are in particular to be seeking to know the Scriptures and to grow in grace so that it would be of help to younger Christians that are coming up under our, our care. Christians are to grow then in grace. And to do this, we need more than topsoil food. We need to be going deeper. And I challenge you today, uh, as I challenge myself, that maybe that devotional aids you're using, maybe you've been using them for 30 years, I don't know. And they're just running, they're now to you because you have grown. And you're not really maybe aware of it, but you have grown. You need to outgrow maybe that particular devotional aid and to seek to try something, something at a higher level, perhaps. Just a suggestion to you, that you might know him better in that way. Yes, topsoil food is good enough, but uh, it's good to get roast beef and tiramisu, isn't it? Something that's got a wee bit of variety and a wee bit of flavor uh, 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 to it. That, uh, well, maybe a wee word of warning there. Uh, too much rich food, too much rich eating will cause a bit of gout. Uh, so we do notice the order here. It's growing grace and then in the knowledge not the other way around, because if, we, if we're just seeking after knowledge, then we can have spiritual gout. If we're feeding too deep and not seeking grace to go with it, then we'll just become theological know-alls, and that, that's not the way eh, to go. So we notice the order here, grow in grace, and then in knowledge. You know, I remember, as I'm saying, just a wee bit of personal background and testimony here. When I was in the Church of Scotland in Brora, we had heard... There was a very good relationship, I have to say, between the Free Church and the Church of Scotland in those days. Reverend Alistair MacLennan, do remember Alistair in your prayers. He's retired uh, to Muir of Ord now. He's there with his wife, Betty. But he, he's had a couple of strokes, and uh, things are not so great for him. The carers going in there uh, to look after him and so on. But he's still at home, but do remember but, uh, Alistair. Alistair was the minister in the, church, in the Church of Scotland. I was converted under him. And then... In, in Broda, it was Ken Larter, an American minister, and there was a good uh, uh, coming and going uh, uh, there in Broda. And we'd heard that, and you'll know this man, of course, I know I remember him with great fondness, I'm sure, James McIntosh, uh, Principal McIntosh, he was here on the, on the Black Isle. We'd heard that he was coming to preach in the evening. He might have been there in the morning, but we had our service in the morning, so we would go to the joint service in the evening. And uh, Principal McIntosh was taking his service. And the reason he was in Brora is that when he had been in Peru, there was a mission house in Brora. Somebody had left the house to the congregation in a place called Dol, just on the south side of Brora, belonged to the church. 
and Principal McIntosh, and his wife's name was Huey, I think, and uh, they came there on furlough, and that's how they were uh, in the Bro- knew the Broda people. But anyway, this is the th- what I'm coming to. As I sat there under his ministry that, that evening, before he said what he was about to say, I thought to myself, gosh, this man's steeped in Scripture. It was oozing out of his, in his prayers and just his demeanor and so on. He was lovely, wasn't he? Those of you who can remember him, he was lovely. The first time I ever saw him or heard him. But then he came and he said this, as he came to the end of his sermon, he says, I will never be back in this pulpit in Brora again. Now that, he, now that he was. But he says, there's one thing I want to leave with you. I have one regret more than any other regrets in my life. One regret, and I want to leave it, I want to share it with you, he said. What's coming now? So, what did he say? He said this. My biggest regret, he said, is that I didn't read the Bible enough. And I thought he knew the Bible inside out. Now, it's understandable uh, being a principal and so on, and a professor and that, uh, that, what work he was involved in, that he should read other books. Absolutely necessary. But this was his testimony towards the end of his life. I'll never be back here again. I want to leave this with you, as I leave it with you too. I don't know if I'll be back here again, (laughs) Alec. I hope so, but God willing. But to read the Bible more to spend more time in the Scriptures. This is the way for grace. I'm sure that reading devotional and other Christian uh, literature, that we can glean much that will help us to to grow in grace, but uh, I don't doubt that if we spend more time with the Bible, we will, under this motto, to know Him better. Not... uh, We get to a stage, well, I can only speak personally, that, you know... We wake up, sell at 7 o'clock, go and have breakfast, come back to bed, read the Bible. It, you can get into a kind of rut with it. And just while well, I'm going through Luke's Gospel, I'm at chapter 14 when I go back to it now. And you read it through and I mean, say a prayer, and I'll, we're off into the day without. But if we have this to know Him better, to be more focused perhaps, and especially as we may be along the road for a, for a long time in the Christian faith, that we need to uh, look, at, look at ourselves uh, with regard uh, to that. Now, but before we can grow in grace, we need to know the God of grace. We need to be converted to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, of course, when I say that, I don't mean that there are people out there that, that aren't Christians, that aren't gracious people. You find that, uh, it may put us to shame at times, that there are many people that are not Christians that are gracious people. But the thing is, uh, with a lot of them anyway, if not all of them, the minute that you mention Jesus, they're not so gracious. They can become quite angry, in fact. Indeed, amongst even those that are more into churchianity rather than Christianity, that many of them while they would, might abide the, the word of, of Jesus. But the moment you turn to the words of Jesus, you need to be born again to get into the kingdom of heaven. We'll see how gracious they are then. It's a good indication to us that if they are gracious, that they're, they're, they're going the right way, that they're facing in the, the right direction, like Lydia, that their heart was opened. But for many, we see that their grace is just natural. But this is about spiritual grace. It affects the natural, sure, many of us may have been at a natural level quite gracious, but this is about being gracious in a spiritual uh, sense. So we need to be in Christ. Uh, Some years ago, indeed before I was married, I planted some fir trees round the croft with my father, and at the same time we put up a corrugated iron fence. And uh, the trees have grown up so big, uh, actually, the, the fir trees, that we've t- taken the tops off them at least twice. But uh, the posts have never grown. And yet the posts of the corrugated, that for the corrugated iron fence, they're made of the same material as the trees. They're both wood. But only one is growing and the other is dead. And that's how it can be. That's the difference between... Uh, 
someone in Christ and someone not in Christ. They're dead spiritually. Now, you might say to me, well, it'd be a miracle, a post put down roots. But that's what the new birth is. It's a miracle. Perhaps a better illustration would be, I remember my father uh, telling me that um, in the field next to the house, uh, they used to plant potatoes. And um, they would, when the potatoes were put down, they would go to the sides of the field and break off branches of the putri trees, the elderberry trees. And if you know the elderberry, it's very soft. And if it gets the right conditions, you can stick it in the ground and it'll grow. And this, they used to break off the branches and they used to stick it at the end of the drills to mark where the potatoes were. And lo and behold, you would say, when you go back to lift the potatoes, we find that these putri trees were growing. And perhaps that's a better illustration for um, a non-Christian. Because the Christian is only dead, the non-Christian is only dead spiritually. They're alive physically, obviously. They're like a broken branch. They're not a dead post as such that can never put out roots. But a, a branch that's broken off can put down roots like the putri tree. And uh, when they receive the gospel and, and uh, pray, pray for them that they would put down roots and that they would come. So the, the non-Christian is, is only spiritually dead, not physically dead, broken off from God. But uh, by God's grace, we're looking to them to be quickened by God, the, the quickener of souls, that they would begin to put down roots. And as we once did ourselves, no, no doubt, and uh, it's then that we, our focus has to be on Christ, to know him better. So that's the first thing. And I should have said at the outset that that's the longest point. Because we have three points now from the rest of the text, and uh, they're, they're much shorter. So... We have to grow in grace. Why? To know him better. But then secondly, we see that we are to grow in knowledge. Why? To, to know him better. Well, it will be of enormous benefit for the Christian to, to know their Savior better. Spurgeon put it uh, this way. He was very good at kind of flowery language, I suppose. But he, he said, grow, grow in the knowledge of Christ. Stand at the cross, he said, and examine his hands. Examine his feet, examine his side, he said. Examine the, the, the wine vinegar and the sponge and the hyssop. Examine the cross. Examine all these things that you may know the Lord Jesus Christ better. And as we see here in the context, a knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Savior, the cross, to examine the Lord Jesus Christ. Besides, we all want to, surely, experience something of a resurrection before we die. I have not yet attained, said the apostle. And we say, wow, the apostle had not yet attained. He wants to know more about the resurrection. He wants to know more of knowing Christ while he was still in this world. And this stands to reason. Why would we want to get to know uh, Christ better? Well, those of us who are in Christ we wouldn't ask that question. It's a silly question. Of course we want to know Christ better. But it's like uh, uh, when we fall in love with somebody, we, we want to get to know them better. But uh, for, for my wife and I, we were, we're 49 years married this year, so God willing, we'll come up for the 50 mark, and it's difficult to get to know something new about somebody you've been with for so long. But that's never the case with Jesus Christ. That's what stunned me in reading that book on the impeccability of Christ, how little I knew about him. Throughout all eternity, we will always be learning about Christ. How much more now? We want to have a foretaste of the church triumphant while we're still in the church militant, to draw near to him and to know him better, to taste something of heaven while we're here on earth. But how can it be done? Well, when we look at the Scriptures, which was the, basically the first point for growing in grace, if we look at the Scriptures, if we take, for example, the book of Ephesians, we find that the first three chapters are about growing in knowledge. It's very doctrinal, the first three chapters of Ephesians. But the amazing thing is that if we're doing this seeking to know him better, 
seeking to grow in grace, that it doesn't make us dead books on theology. Because when we go on then from chapter 4 to chapter 6, we find it's all about how to live the Christian life. How to live the Christian life is coming out of the, do- the, the doctrine of the first three chapters. To know him better. And we will love our wives better. We will love our husbands better. We will love our ch- oh, that's, that's Ephesians. In the last three chapters. How to love your family better. How to love the, your neighbor better. To be l- not dead books on theology. But to be living epistles known and read by all men. To know him better will be, make us more like him. To be better witnesses in the society that is sitting in darkness. And I think that's all I really need to say here. But we are to to, to seek to enter into knowing more about Christ's person. To know more about his finished work. To know more about his perfect life. His propitiating death the expiation that he provided for us to cover our crimes, to to know about those things, to know about his substitutionary death, his resurrection, his glorious ascension, his uh, session at the right hand of the Lord God Almighty in all power, and about his second coming, which part of this chapter is, is about, of what that is to come. To know him better, to grow in grace, and now to grow in knowledge. But then thirdly, We are to seek to grow in praise. Why? To know him better. What does the text say? The text says to praise him now and forever. And when eternity comes, yes, goes without question. When eternity comes, we'll praise him forever. But we notice the text isn't just saying wait for eternity and we'll praise him then. It's saying praise him Now, why? To know him better. Praises for the Savior will go on forever. But we don't have to wait forever to praise him. Because the text is saying, praise him now. Now, tonight, if you get uh, for tonight, uh, I'm going to be looking at Luke chapter 15. Uh, Just a heads up if you want to look at it this afternoon. It's the Lord's Day after all. I'm sure you spend some time with the scriptures. Uh, Luke chapter 15 is the three parables parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, the prodigal son. I don't want to uh, concentrate on just one of the parables, but just to look at the chapter as a whole. But in in one place in particular in the chapter, but maybe two even, we're told that the angels rejoice when a sinner repents. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing because it's not the angels that have been saved. The angels know more about the holiness of God than we do. They know more about uh, well, looking down on us, uh, how sinful we are, and they're astonished that God should send his Son into this world to be the propitiating sacrifice uh, to atone for our sins. They're astonished at all that. And then when a sinner repents, they rejoice. But the point is this. It's not the angels that were saved. It's you that has been saved if you're in Christ. So, if they rejoice and they're not being saved, how much more should you, you praise God, praise the Savior, because you're the one that's actually being saved? Amazing. It's the Christian, the broken branch, that now has roots and is seeking to grow in grace and in knowledge of Christ, that is to praise, is now a child of God. It's a Christian who has put their roots down and onto the rock, or, well... <laughs> We're clashing with metaphors here. We put our feet upon the rock of our salvation, and he establishes our way, Psalm 40. But believers, therefore, have every reason to rejoice now. Why? Because the Savior deserves our praise because he has given to us his life. And he's given us life. And the thing is, as we'll be singing in our closing psalm, it's a life that will never end. It's great to know that when we're getting, get, when the years are passing by, isn't it? As I said, it's hard to believe the years have gone by since I was here as your uh, intermoderator when I was minister in Fort Rose. Where have those years gone? And it's good to take comfort to know, well, when they are over, that we're not over. We're going to live forever. 
And because of that, we are to praise him now. Whatever uh, difficulties we may have with our bodies and the passing of time and the challenges that we have even in, in the spiritual things of, of, of the gospel, we are the ones that are saved and therefore we are the ones that are to give praise to the Savior now. Our praises, of course, will never be perfect until eternity comes. Our lives in the sinful world will end, but our praises will never end. We see that here. The glory of the cross shall never end. The victory over the grave will never end. Not throughout all eternity. The glorious resurrection will be forever a praise. But oh, that we might taste something of the praise of the church triumphant, as we said, while we're still in this world. It is, after all, to him now and forever. So therefore, seek to grow in grace and in knowledge so that you may praise him now and throughout all eternity to know him better. Then lastly and very briefly, the last word that we have in the text is the word Amen. So fourthly, seek to grow in affirmation of your faith affirmation. That's the word amen. To say amen to this. To know him better. Amen. This is a, to grow in affirmation then of our faith. So our text end with one, ends with one word. Amen. Amen is primarily the word that we use to affirm something that we hope for, that we pray for, that we want to happen, that we, we, that we believe to be true. That is our heart's desire. Is it your heart's desire to grow in grace? I'm sure it is. Is it your heart's desire to grow in knowledge of Christ? I'm sure it is. Is it your heart's desire to, to praise him now and forever? I'm sure it is. Therefore, you can say amen, 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 amen to those four things. It's the affirmation of our faith to know him better. So the word amen can be used as a pledge, an amen of resolution. It means I solemnly pledge myself to seek in God's strength to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Christ, to praise him more now. A pledge to know the Savior who will be with both now and throughout all eternity to say amen. So therefore, in closing, uh, may I commend this, well, it's to Tom Uckert's uh, motto that he gave to me, uh, but I, I hope it's one that you might take up for yourselves as well, uh, commend this, uh, this, to take this motto, to know him better, to be your own. And uh, to, in Old Testament terms, which unfortunately was, all too often taken in a literal sense rather than a spiritual sense, to write it on your foreheads and to write it on your arms. You know, the Pharisees took it literally and they had phylacteries with the Word of God and leather pouches tied to their arms and to their heads. That's not what it was talking about. It was talking about the heart to take, the, to take this motto or to take, the, the, well, for that, to take the Word of God, to have it in your mind, to have it in your arms, to, to, to work it out, to do it, to have it in your feet and to walk in it, to put it on your doorposts, your gates of your house and so on. You the Old Testament imagery. But this, to know Him better, to write it on your hearts, to write it on your arms and your minds, your gates and your doors. And especially... Not have to do it literally, but certainly to do it in a, in a metaphorical sense, especially to write it on your Bible, that every time you open it, to know him better. Why? That you might grow in grace and in the knowledge of Christ and to praise him both now and forevermore. Amen. So let's pray. Gracious God, we pray indeed for grace. Forgive us if we've not sought this before. For surely you're a God who would give this to us when we think of earthly fathers uh, or a son asking for bread who wouldn't receive a, a stone or a snake. So when we come to our heavenly Father and ask for grace, surely that you, this is something that you'd be most willing to give to us. And so that we ask for it. And we pray too that you'd help us, however long or short we've been on the Christian road, to 
know more of the Lord Jesus Christ, because there's certainly always more to know. And for those who, as yet, have not set out on the Christian road, that they may ask that their roots would go down, that they'd trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and all he has done for them, and that together we may indeed praise you and praise the Savior both now and look forward to that great day when we will be all together praising you forever and going on in the new heaven and the new earth to make new discoveries and to know more of Christ even then. We give thanks for your grace towards us. Continue with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the, the last uh, song is uh, Psalm 72. <clears throat> Psalm 72 at verse 17. Uh, this name forever shall endure. It's a doxology, really. Uh, last like the sun it shall. Man, men shall be blessed. In him and blessed all nations shall him call. So let's say, stand to sing these familiar verses, I suppose. Psalm 72 at verse 17. <clears throat> 